uh, some of the workloads which are uh, lower value and more uh, computationally intensive uh, out of the, the data warehouse. So you're using it primarily for you know, ad hoc theory uh, and uh, operational reporting workloads. Uh, so those are the batch workloads for which uh, Cloudera uh, has made its name uh, today. The interactive workloads that we support, uh, currently uh, HBase is used to do application data delivery. So if you need a small amount of data, um, you know, HBase the data model is basically a, a spreadsheet where each cell has a set of versions. And if you want to retrieve a small number of rows uh, in, in uh, you know, tens or hundreds of milliseconds, HBase is very, very good for that and it can scale to, uh, to petabytes. Uh, but if you wanted to start to do analysis across many rows, uh, you know, millions, billions, trillions of rows, uh, HBase plus MapReduce uh, are really only able to do that in a batch fashion, not an interactive fashion. Um, so we went out to our customer base uh, and we said, well, okay, how many of you guys are using Hive? About two thirds of our, our customer base uses Hive um, and, and a little over half uses HBase to try and get uh, you know, real-time interactive analytics. But the reality is HBase is good for real-time application data serving, but not for real-time uh, analytics. You need something more for that. Um, we also saw that over half of our customers are loading data into their new clusters every 90 minutes or less. So sometimes people talk, talk about Hadoop and they say, oh, it's like tape, it's, it's an archival system. Uh, but the reality is when you start talking about hourly uh, data loading, that's, a, that's an operational system. Um, so 71% currently move data from Hadoop into an RDBMS for their interactive SQL query workloads. So if we go back to that architecture diagram, they're using uh, CDH, so that ELC offload, data refinery, uh, whatever you'd like to call it, and then they push data into the data warehouse so that they can do interactive query delivery. Um, but 62% of them would prefer to consolidate into a single platform. So rather than running both, uh, why not just do both of those workloads um, inside of Hadoop? So that's why we built Clutter Impala. So Clutter Impala is an alternative query execution engine uh, to MapReduce. Uh, it's built from the ground up uh, to be um, as fast as possible for executing uh, general purpose SQL queries, whether they're analytical or transactional. Um, and you know the, the, the minimum query response time is actually uh, measured in microseconds for Impala, so it can be uh, very very low latency. Um, but as we as we build it out, so currently there's no fault tolerance built into the system, uh, but the intent is to make it to be able to run very long running queries as well. Um, so the the thing that we like most about Impala is that it runs directly with, within Hadoop. So uh, you can use it over data stored in HDFS, you can use it over data stored in HBase, and it runs on the same nodes as your Hadoop processes. So this means you can have a, a single resource manager uh, managing both uh, MapReduce uh, and Impala. Uh, it means that you don't have to maintain separate metadata repositories, uh, you know, separate hardware, uh, separate dialects of SQL. Uh, so a lot of the, uh, the database integrations that we've seen uh, in our customer base are unsatisfying for a lot of these reasons. So we think that this is a lot better way to get interactive uh, SQL query response over uh, structured data that's uh, produced uh, within your Hadoop cluster. Uh, and uh, Clutter and Paul is very high performance. So it's written from the ground up in C++ instead of Java. It uses LLVM for runtime code generation for uh, maximum CPU efficiency. And as I mentioned, it's a completely new execution engine. It's not MapReduce. It's not a modified version of Postgres. It's written from the ground up uh, using all the different uh, modern query processing techniques. Uh, and one of my favorite parts about Impala is that we launched it with uh, validated beta partners. So if you were at Hadoop World, you may have had a chance to play with the, the demo of MicroStrategy running directly against Impala. Um, so you can actually do interactive BI uh, over your data store in Hadoop uh, using Impala. It's, it's got an ODBC driver today. The JDBC driver will be ready in time for the uh, general availability. And uh, so we can, we can work with these additional uh, BI tools like ClickView, Tableau, and Tahoe um, through. And Capgemini as a service partner uh, who, who's got experience uh, setting up Impala and getting it running nicely. So the new clutter of workloads that you can imagine using with Hadoop uh, today are these operational reporting and ad hoc query workloads that you traditionally associate with uh, business intelligence and analytics. So in a deployment, uh, you can imagine uh, using Impala. Uh, so one way to use Impala would be to, uh, you're using CDH as your ELC offload engine. Um, and so then rather than publishing the data into the, the structured data into the data warehouse, you just leave it in CDH and those arrows that say business intelligence and analytics, uh, you know, you do those against CDH uh, instead of the data warehouse. Uh, so there still is a, set of, a subset of the data for which the data warehouse um, is, 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 is very useful. You know, we don't have uh, UDFs implemented in Impala yet. We don't have uh, analytical functions. Uh, there's, a, there's a variety of things that we, you know, it's a, it's, it's a relatively young project in that regard. So, you know, we're not advocating that the data warehouse uh, doesn't exist. And in fact, what we actually see in practice is that uh, because uh, it's so cheap to store data in CDH, uh, that the amount of overall data that's collected within the organization grows. And
and uh, the data warehouse actually ends up growing. So while you're taking some workloads off of the data warehouse, uh, the, the overall amount of data managed by uh, the infrastructure grows. So for the example at Facebook, when we moved, we had a 10 terabyte Oracle data warehouse, but when we put uh, Hadoop uh, between our application data stores and our data warehouse, we ended up with a 10 petabyte uh, Hadoop infrastructure and a 40 terabyte data warehouse. So the overall data that we manage as an organization uh, went up quite a bit. So that's how, uh, that's how we uh, see these infrastructures evolving uh, in our customer base. And the other nice thing about Impala is that it's even useful at one node. One of the problems we've had at uh, Cloudera uh, for a long time is that Hadoop is very difficult to get started with because there's really a fixed cost to MapReduce jobs and it's only really useful if you have you know, a terabyte or more of data. Uh, but there's been some very nice uh, external blog posts that not motivated by Cloudera in any way, just people trying out the open source product, uh, where they've been able to get better query response than uh, things like MySQL or Postgres uh, on a single node with Impala. So it's a really great way to just, if you need a little departmental data mart, or if you want to spin up and do some analytics, I actually use it when I'm working on things like Kaggle competitions. Because uh, to me, it's with Cloudera Manager, it's the easiest uh, scalable uh, open source data warehouse uh, to get working with today. So I only have like two minutes, so. <laughs> I wanted to spend a little more time talking about what I saw in the future, and I asked you guys to think about that as well. Um, so, you know, the biggest additional workload that we wanted to bring into Cloudera clusters, you know, you can think about uh, Cloudera as essentially uh, converging ETL, data warehousing, and archival storage into a single infrastructure. And, uh, you know, it's got, it's got a general purpose resource manager, so we can put a variety of additional workloads on top of that. Um, so if you think of MapReduce as kind of the core of our ETL uh, processing engine, and Impala as the core of sort of the data warehouse workloads, um, then additional uh, workloads that we imagine wanting to be able to bring into Cloudera clusters uh, include things like search, uh, you know, uh, MPI processing, uh, stream data processing, graph computations, linear algebra, uh, optimization problems, uh, and simulation. So things that you might do with a separate HPC compute grid today, uh, ultimately it'd be nice if you could do that uh, inside of a um, inside of a new cluster as well. Uh, so these are things that uh, you know we're thinking about now that we have this general purpose resource manager. There's, problems that we can address, but we haven't necessarily uh, ordered and begun attacking all of them yet. So it's, it's useful for me to get the feedback uh, from you folks on which one of those kinds of workloads would be most interesting to you. Um, I'm also very interested in the last mile. So Cloudera is an infrastructure technology. Uh, we're not really all the way out to the end user. Uh, we, we really rely on our partners uh, to deliver that last mile, and that's the plan uh, for the foreseeable future. You know, we think that there's huge businesses that are going to be built around uh, Hadoop. And I'd love to hear from you guys, you know, what sort of, uh, for example, uh, scrubbed and managed data sets are you bringing into your clusters to do analysis with uh, that are available at all in the public? What languages are you using? You know, things like Julia are attempting to, and languages like Python are improving uh, rapidly for, uh, for data analysis. Uh, the libraries you use within those languages, things like Pandas uh, and Python are very useful. And then uh, an IDE for data scientists is very interesting to me uh, to be able to incorporate all aspects of the data science workflow, data preparation, uh, you know, exploration, model fitting, validation, deployment. Uh, you know, so R Studio, for example, has done some very interesting things here. Um, I'm very curious if we can one day get a data scientist uh, behind a single cockpit rather than having to go through a variety of tools. Um, and then I won't talk too much about uh, how I actually see the changes in how I do data science on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, but in any case, uh, before I wrap up, I'd love to hear from at least one or two people on uh, the question that I asked uh, when we got started. So how do you think that your job as a data scientist is going to change uh, in two years. Has anybody, has anybody thought of something? Nobody raises their hand. I'm going to call on people. Start a class. You know, see what I can do. All right. So there's a person who has the job title of data scientist. <laughs> so you're it. What, what do you think is going to be the most different two years from now? <laughs> is uh, Cloudera 
the, the uh, answer you're looking for. Uh, so <laughs> yeah, I'm not, I'm not really interested in like you know new things. Yeah. Uh, so I was glad you mentioned R Studio. Yeah. You know, right now that's the primary thing we're using for exploratory analysis and for writing some of the models that we have mm -hmm. uh, you know, for the algorithms we have for recommendation for search. Yeah. Uh, so I haven't tried using. Uh, any of the infrastructure that interfaces could do with R, right. but that's potentially really interesting. Fair enough. Guys move All right, so now somebody in a suit. Maybe it's close enough. Data scientist, but I was just thinking about the question is the uh, the idea of secure uh, of the issues of security and uh, compliance. I think uh, you know in terms of you know, restoring data that might have privacy issues or. Uh, security in terms of being accessible outside of the uh, enterprise, and as well as uh, compliance issues. So, mm -hmm. so. Yeah, I'd love to, to hear more about the specifics. I mean, we have, um, you know, Kerberos-based uh, author, uh, authentication uh, integrated throughout the stack, um, and pretty standard uh, permission schemes for um, uh, authorization. And you know, we've been um, hard at work on a lot of sort of data governance products. You might be interested in as well. Um, so you want to talk off. I think something in, in my space that we're going to see more of is thinking of data as data products. Because mm -hmm. you know, as data gets more shared in the financial industry between departments and there's more governance on it, it has to become something that is more concrete mm -hmm. that we work with. And, and uh, actually, it's funny because uh, we, we thought, had thought in my group that we thought of that term, uh, data product. <laughs> and now, now I see that many years before it has already been coined, but it, it's, it's sort of coming out that we have to we have to work with data as a product. Yeah, and there's really interesting companies uh, like uh, Factual, for example, whose product is data. <laughs> like, yeah. You know, they're literally just an API into uh, funds and aggregated data set. Um, and obviously, in your space, companies um, like Bloomberg or Reuters in the market, um, sort of like you know, just start for data as the thing from that. Um, I think it's pretty interesting too. Is our CEO is he's a Freeman based uh, system machine learning engineer. Um, Time for one more, are we good? Is there one more question? Mm. All right, great. Great, thank you, Jeff.